Okay. I think it's time to start. It's just past one o'clock. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to the Royal Entomological Societies, which I will be calling the RES from now on, um, event Perceptions of Insects, Phileas and Phobias. It's running as part of Insect Week. Um, please do check the Insect Week website, insectweek.co.uk, to find out what's happening near you and online throughout this week. I'm Adam Hart, I'm trustee and fellow of the RES, and I'm very much on the side of philia, although um, if I'm quite honest, come the autumn, um, a few house spiders can sometimes push me onto the other side, um, because today what we're gonna do is get to the heart of a really important topic in entomology and also an important topic for some people um, and, and life in general. It's why do some people love and some people hate and are actually phobic to the point of it becoming a major problem in their life, um, insects. Um, for the purposes of this event, we're going to let a few other creatures into the insect club because I imagine we'll probably be talking a little bit about spiders already mentioned, um, centipedes and other leggy creatures, you get the idea. I'm joined by a fantastic panel today, Professor Siren Sumner, Dr. Fran Colt, Dr. Liam Hathaway and Dr. Verity Jones. I'll introduce each of them in a moment, uh, but the format for the event is pretty simple. Each of our panellists is going to talk for a little bit about their feelings towards insects, some of the work that they've been doing, and help us to shed some of the light on why we feel the way that we feel about, about these insects, about these organisms. And after that, we'll have plenty of time for some questions and discussions. First, though, uh, we'd like to do a quick poll. It's a fairly obvious poll, um, and it's a poll basically asking whether or not you like insects or whether you don't like insects. We want to test the temperature of the room when it comes down to our sort of focal animals today. So hopefully you will be able to see a poll coming up very shortly. I can see it, excellent. And we'd like you to answer the question. It's completely anonymous. We won't be chasing you out afterwards to see what sort, what sort of crowd we've got in, whether we have a, a, a filiac or a phobic crowd in today. So we're getting a fair few of you answering, I think. Only a handful of you left to answer. I've got to say, I can see the results uh, coming up on my screen. And it, it does appear that we're a very unbalanced room here, <laughs> rather a biased crowd. Um, let's end the poll now. If I press on that, hopefully you can see the results. Uh, it's 100%, 100% crowd. We are very much a selected group of why we love uh, of people that love insects so we may be able to um we may be a little bit biased when it comes to thinking about why some people hate insects but that's certainly something that i'd like to to dig into a little bit as we go through all right bearing in mind we started at 100 loving insects and i want to run that poll again at the end i really hope that by the end we don't end up <laughs> swaying some people into hating insects but i guess we'll see all right let's crack on with our panelists Francisca Colt is a researcher in science communication. Hi, Fran, if you can. Hello there. Uh, at the University of York, she's interested in the history and science of literature, and she's a research fellow based at the Science and Technology Studies Unit up there in York. Besides her research on narrative and metaphor, especially in health and environmental communication in history and present, she has an interest in what shapes the shifting reputations and meanings of insects, and has recently published on the insects in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass examining the author's own interest in entomology and Victorian theological symbolism, especially of bees, wasps, and moths. And we'll be hearing a lot more about wasps, certainly later on from Syrian. Her book, Alice Through the Wonder Glass, will be published with Reaction Press next year. She's also a broadcaster and curator and is currently working with the BBC on a programme on moths, another group of insects that many people seem to have quite negative perceptions about. She's gonna tell us about some instances of how popular culture has contributed to shaping perceptions of insects with some examples from Victorian children's literature, popular entomology, and some contemporary examples. Thanks, Fran, and the floor is yours. Right, hello. Um, I'll be setting the scene a little bit. Um, thank you so much for having me at this wonderful event. Um, even though I'm a science historian and a literary scholar, I actually work and teach at a sociological department, which caters to all sorts of people, to budding lawyers, to criminologists, politologists, and environmental scientists, amongst others, um, who can take our modules. And every year I teach a class on pests. And when I ask students to Google pests and compile a list of which ones of the creatures in the results they agree with 
that they feel are definitely pests and are or disagree with and think, oh no, these shouldn't be pests. The results are often really illuminating. Um, they vary a bit from group to group and year to year, but we usually always argue about rats and cats, whether they are pests. But one thing that's an absolute constant is that my students most often think that insects, the entire class of them, are pests. They're awful and we should get rid of them. Um, we then dig deeper about what makes us think so, and we very and that very quickly makes students um and ah about where, what their actually shapes their perceptions, and that their perceptions have become influenced quite heavily by popular culture, literature, and the sort of literature even they read in early childhood, and how these influences still hold uh, and what influence they still hold over their perceptions today, um, and how they influence their acceptance even of biodiversity loss, think, you know, well, spiders hate them, good to go, great if they all die out, um, or even make them accept um, deliberately harmful actions towards biodiversity. So what and how does by um, popular culture change our views of insects and influence our views of insects? I very skip, briefly skip over the influence, for instance, of horror films that inflate quite greatly the size of insects and harness their ability to creep up on you and hide in spaces and their gory, blood-sucking, contaminating powers that usually make students who have never in their life seen a cockroach terrified of cockroaches. But the truth is, it depends massively on the place and the time in which you've grown up. What sort of thing has shaped your views and to what views of insects we have become um, exposed? So I, for instance, grew up in East Germany and most of the children's literature that we read came from the Soviet Union and the Soviet children's books love insects. They really do because they're collectivized workers, they're dedicated to production and the collective. And um, in this rather innocent children's book here, how the mole got his trousers, you can see how they're portrayed in exactly this way. And they should be what children should aspire to become in this society, like the ants here collecting material and weaving collectively without ever questioning the trousers of the mole. But we get a rather different image for insects and I'm being deliberately non-specific for a moment, once you start looking at um, different types of popular culture. Over the pandemic, for instance, you might have been playing Animal Crossing, in which we encounter Bladders, who is an owl, but also the curator of the local natural history museum, to whom you deliver insects you collect in the game, and he really hates insects, like really hates insects. But what's interesting, though, is that Blathers, who's the curator, his hatred of insects is almost always qualified with a but, and thus rather playfully undermining itself. He admits that insects are magnificent and useful, but oh my god, they're insects, you can't possibly like them. So what that hints at is there really is a rather different story to be told, a story indeed, um, to which I'll, I'll quickly turn. Um, to wrap this up, um, for instance, in Victorian England. In my research, I'm quite interested in Victorian natural history books. Um, those were books for children, which were hugely popular and published in huge quantities in the Victorian age and fueled a generation of budding amateur entomologists and citizen scientists. They were also often published by Christian naturalists who wanted to entice children to pay attention especially um, to the most minute parts of creation, a process which would enable the naturalist to admire even the most hatred, hated of creatures. And the Reverend John Wood, who's, who these books are by, um, said that these hated creatures are very often wasps and other creatures that sting. But by understanding their role in creation, or to put it in more contemporary terms, um, their significance in ecology, this would enable us to not hate in, in, in insects, sorry, but to understand their role and recognize their role in ecology. And through that, 
more widely, the uses of insects which cannot possibly make us hate them. Now, this is interesting when we come to the example of moths, um, which I'll shortly wrap up with, um, which are an interesting example because my students very often name moths as the uh, one of the most hated insects when we come to talk about them in our seminars. Um, and what they think is not the beautiful sort of moths that we saw in our cover slide, but um, they often think of the clothes moths. And um, John Wood, who I've picked as an example here, had very interesting views on the clothes moths, because in a very classic Victorian moralistic term, he started to explain the reason that um, these moths had come to prey and the circumstances in which these moths have come to prey on clothes, which was the point at which humans started hoarding them. And so the humble clothes moth becomes the one who's exposing, chastising the vanity which the author implies underlies the hoarding of garments. And But it's actually what he's doing here is brilliantly highlighting how moths have co-evolved and in huge diversity with and adjusted to changes in their environments in which what in whatever circumstances they have always found um, sources of food. And this wasn't uncommon. Um, all sorts of theological metaphors and parables were projected onto these things in nature. Um, moths, for instance, were seen as a, um, as a theological metaphor for the evolution of the soul from something that dwells in the ground, is nourished on earth, transforms into a beautiful flying build a being that flies towards the flame um, being God and then transcends this world in it. So whatever your religious inclinations are, there's an interesting tension to be observed here between a type of popular literature that directs our gaze and patience towards examining insects closely to understand through them the precarious balance of ecology of which they are an indicator and whose beauty and efficiency not even an entomophobic curator owl can deny. So I'll stop here. That's brilliant. Thank you, Fran. And uh, the next time that someone says to me that they don't like moths, I'm going to point out to them that they are a theological metaphor for the soul and, um, and see if that shuts them up. I, I feel that it might do. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. We're going to move from sort of Victorian cultural representations of, of insects to a more contemporary representation with our next speaker, Liam Hathaway. Uh, Liam recently earned his PhD at De Montfort University by conducting an eco-cultural investigation of the Killer Bug movie. Um, I have to say I'm a bit of a fan of some of those uh, some of those B movies, them and so on. They're always good to sit down and watch. Though he's interested in all kinds of film, his key interests lie in neo noir, horror, and the post apocalyptic, with a particular emphasis on how genre films engage with the cultural moment. He's written for multiple edited collections and often provides screening notes for London science fiction theatre. And he's going to talk to us today about film and movie representations of insects. So Liam, over to you. Um, and I noticed, by the way, it's a quick aside. I see some people putting some questions and, and comments in the chat. Please carry on doing that and feel free to put some questions in the Q&A as well. But Liam, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, I'm Liam. So um, first off, a big thank you to invite me to this panel. It's, uh, it's actually the first time I've uh, been a part of something like this. So yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so again, like as a quick introduction, uh, I very recently completed my uh, PhD uh, with my thesis essentially combining two fascinations I've had my entire life, uh, those are cinema and bugs. Uh, the primary objective of my thesis was to give an eco-cultural history of the uh, cinematic killer bug subgenre. <clears throat> um, the early stage of my thesis uh, uh, hinged upon me shifting the dominant scholarly discourse and public opinion that suggests that all US killer bug films and uh, creature features of the 1950s were engaging with uh, the real world atomic anxiety and cold war fears of the time. Uh, so we're talking about you know, films like uh, Them, uh, which had giant irradiated ants, uh, Tarantula with giant irradiated tarantulas, and not so classics like uh, Attack of the Giant Leeches and uh, The Deadly Mantis that uh, in their own way, are, you know, they're, they're still kind of great. Uh, though the readings that suggest these films are engaging with those aforementioned cultural anxieties. Oops, that's where I am. Where did I go? Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Though the readings that suggest these uh, films are engaging with those uh, aforementioned cultural anxieties are perfectly valid, 
uh, they have reached uh, orthodoxy status, whereas the rest of the killer bug subgenre had received scant cultural analysis. Uh, my solution then was to observe the entire subgenre in conjunction with re uh, real world environmentalist and ecological problems and um, anxieties and use primary sources to aid my analysis. After all, the killer bug subgenre first gained traction in the 1950s alongside the modern environmentalist movement. Uh, then in the 1970s, environmentalism exploded and so did the natural horror and killer bug subgenres. In the 1980s, uh, President Reagan downplayed and undermined environmentalism whilst killer book films faded. And in the 1990s, environmentalism entered a resurgence and killer book films returned to prominence. Uh, so there's definitely some broad synchronicity for me to uh, work with and tease out, uh, tease out the finer correlations between the films and reality. Uh, though they can often appear schlocky or cheesy, uh, these films do often evoke real world uh, ecological and environmental issues. Uh, Kingdom of the Spiders, in which William Shatner is plagued by tarantulas, reflects insidious uh, pen pesticide issues. Uh, the Swarm, in which Michael Caine mostly screams at everyone in the film, links to killer bee hysteria of the 1970s. And uh, Mimic, in which uh, Mara Savino smears bug slime all over herself, uh, connects with anxieties surrounding genetic engineering, and so on and so forth. However, these films also collectively remind us just what an important natural component bugs are within our ecosystems. Uh, they ultimately and broadly display that if we attempt to eradicate entirely, um, biologically manipulate or infringe upon bugs too much, this will likely knock, knock our fragile ecosystems off balance. Uh, this is why these films are ultimately less concerned with depicting bugs purely as monsters um, and more concerned with displaying them fighting back against unscrupulous or avaricious humans who are ignorant um, about the environment's importance. Uh, this is why the stories in these films uh, very often come across as cautionary and usually revere the books with some films even displaying them as equaling or superseding humankind's place in the food chain. Uh, outside of my study, however, I am left with uh, bigger questions and issues I've not yet reconciled so I've brought here with me. Uh, the first pertains to the conundrum regarding how killer bug media in general is simultaneously extolling and the significance of bugs whilst also aiming to be scary in a, you know, they fit in the horror genre. Uh, in other words, is the notion of a killer bug narrative ultimately counterproductive to their intentions and do they or don't they affirm negative perceptions surrounding bugs? Uh, similarly, the, there is a certain irony to how the majority of these films end with people eradicating the killer bug threat that the humans have had a hand in creating. Uh, though this irony can be uh, largely can largely be interpreted as intentional, uh, could it be perceived as damaging to the perceptions of bugs too? Uh, and yeah, those are just a few of the questions that Master didn't quite have the scope to encompass and that I brought here. And uh, and yeah, that's it. That's brilliant. Thanks, Liam. Um, the Swarm is a particular favourite of mine. I, I remember watching it in a Mexican hotel room whilst studying bees with my supervisor, who was a who, who is uh, a bee expert. And much to my surprise, he absolutely loved it. It's um, it's, it's it almost falls into that. It's so bad. It's good category. I think it's a it's, it's a classic of its type. Um, so yeah, thank you for Liam, to Liam for um, giving us that kind of overview of, of how insects and, and things are portrayed within um, cinema. We're going to move into uh, a slightly more sort of, uh, I guess, well, scientific's the wrong word, really, a slightly more um, specific way of looking at how insects are portrayed with our next speaker, who is Professor Sirian Sunder. Now, I've known Sirian for uh, longer than I'm guessing either of us would like to admit to. Um, She's Professor in Behavioural Ecology at University College London. She's been working on wasps for most of her life. She looks at the evolution of social behaviour in them and um, co-founded with me the Big Wasp Survey, which is a citizen science approach to, to look at um, wasp distribution and biodiversity through the UK. She's an advocate for female scientists and co-founded Soapbox Science. And this year, her book, her fabulous book about wasps, Endless Forms, The Secret World of Wasps, is published. Um, Syrian's done some research on the perception of insects, actually asking people what they think and coming up with all kinds of approaches. And she's going to tell us a little bit about that now. So Syrian, it's over to you. Thanks very much, Adam. This is really exciting. I've really enjoyed uh, hearing um, what the previous speakers have had to say. So as Adam says, uh, we've been working together for quite a many years now um, on perceptions of wasps. And I seem to have spent quite a lot of my, my recent life um, 
doing things like dressing up as a wasp, standing on stage, trying to persuade the public that uh, they too should love wasps. Um, the picture at the bottom here of this slide uh, is uh, lots of kids at um, a Royal Entomological Society event at uh, New Scientist Live a couple of years ago where we got kids to paint, uh, well, colour in face um, masks of different types of wasps so these are different the markings of the different types of social wasps that you get in the UK just to kind of bring home the diversity of wasps that we actually benefit from. Now you probably think about wasps as being these guys these are the uh, Vespula wasps they're picnic wasps that will be bothering you um, in a few weeks time no doubt when you get in your barbecue out um, and unfortunately, because of their behaviour at our picnics, they do give wasps a bit of a bad name, such that if you do have a look on the internet to find out how wasps are portrayed, these are the sorts of images that you get. So this kind of sings to the tune of some of the previous speakers about the, the way that these insects, the way insects are portrayed in, the, in, the, in cultural literature and in film, Basically, wherever you see wasps portrayed in popular culture, they are very much depicted as the gangsters of the insect world. And yet, as someone who's been working on wasps for over 20 years, I, I was becoming rather tired of the fact that everywhere I went, whenever anyone asked me, what do you do? What do you study? I study wasps. And they'd say, oh, why do you study wasps? What's the point of wasps? Um, I was getting a bit fed up with this and I thought, well, surely, surely not everyone can feel so negative about these insects. Don't they realise how incredibly interesting and exciting and amazing and important these insects are? So in order to test whether this was just a few anecdotes that came my way and it was just the, the bad press that get on, gets on the Internet, um, some colleagues of mine uh, and I ran a survey, pu public survey online where we asked uh, 750 members of the public to use words to describe different insects. Um, so in the top left-hand corner uh, is, the, uh, is, is the wasps, and the top right-hand uh, is the bees, and then we've got flies and butterflies at the bottom part of the, of the slide. And the size of the word indicates the number of people who use that word to describe that insect. So the bigger the word, the more often that word was used to describe that insect. And bees were described in terms of their utility. So honey, pollination, flower, pollen. Um, butterflies were described in terms of their, how beautiful they are, how delicate, pretty, very empathic words. Flies, okay, I'll admit, flies didn't do too well. They are annoying, dirty. Um, buzzy, maggoty. But look at the wasps, look at that top left hand corner. The, basically, the main word that people use to describe wasps is that they sting. And this, there's no information in that figure about people's perceptions as wasps in terms of what they do in the environment. And I'm very perplexed by the fact that people are obsessed about the wasp and its sting because, of course, bees sting. Um, so why don't we feel the same way about bees? And the other thing about wasps is that naturally not all of them sting. There's over 100,000 species of wasps and about 70% um, of them are actually completely stingless. They're parasitoid wasps. They don't have a sting. They have an ovipositor instead, which is the egg laying sheath, um, which then became modified um, through evolutionary time to become a sting. But equally, the yellow jacket picnic bothering wasp it actually represents less than 0.1% of all species of wasps. They are, represent a very tiny, tiny proportion of wasp, what wasps are. This figure here shows you a splattering of the diversity of the wasps across the group. And these, these photos are taken from a poll of Twitter's favourite wasps. So people on Twitter posted their favourite wasp, and this is a summary of some of the top the top voted wasps. So wasps are really diverse and incredibly speciose. So why on earth do people still think of wasps as only being that stingy picnic wasp? And why do they feel such animosity towards them? 
So in the same study where we asked people to uh, describe some, we use some words to describe wasps and bees, we also asked them to rate the value of these insects in terms of their pollination and their predation power. And so on the left hand side of this figure, the y axis tells you about how they scored them. So zero of usefulness means that they think that those insects have absolutely no use whatsoever in the ecosystem in terms of pollination or predation. If they scored it up towards the nine or the 10, it would indicate that those people thought that that insect was especially important for those particular roles. So I'd just like you to look at the left-hand side of that figure under the pollination and look at the bees. And this was fantastic news. It shows that, uh, so most of the public scored the bees as very highly on that pollination um, gradient. They gave them scores of at least seven to, to 10, which means that the public really do understand what bees do in the environment. They're really important for pollination. On the other hand, people had absolutely no idea whether wasps might be important for pollination or not. So there was a pretty random distribution as to whether they gave them a high or a low score in terms of their utility as pollinators. Now let's skip to the left hand side of that figure to the predation. And as expected, well done public again, the, the bees were not scored very highly for the usefulness as predators. That's so all scoring around about zero. Um, whereas the wasps actually should be scoring very highly for predation because that's what they do. They hunt other arthropods, they are predators. And yet the public were disappointingly bad at identifying wasps as being useful in predation because if they had understood wasps as being key roles, their key role being predation, then the figure for the wasp predation would look exactly like the bee one does uh, on the other side of the, of the figure. So I think what this tells us is that people do not appreciate wasps, people don't put up with wasps because they don't tolerate them, because they don't understand what they do in the environment. Wasps sting, bees sting, but people understand that bees pollinate and so they perhaps are more inclined to tolerate the occasional threat that a bee might, might, might face them because they understand that these insects are important in the environment. So I think that maybe if we understood better about what wasps do in the environment, then we would perhaps be much more tolerant in learning to live alongside them. Um, so these are just examples of how wasps are important in ecosystems. They are predators, particularly your, your picnic um, bothering wasp, your yellow jacket wasp that you'll find in the summer. They eat, they're generalist predators, they will eat pretty much any kind of um, arthropod that they might come across. So that could be caterpillars on your, your um, lettuces or aphids on your tomato plants or even spiders and, and weevils. And they do also eat moths. Moths keeps coming up as one of those most phobic insects. So they also eat moths. So they're doing a really important service in regulating the levels of these insect populations. Wasps are also pollinators. In fact, some of the best evolutionary stories of mutualisms and, and um, manipulation come from the wasps. Take the fig wasps, for example. There are over 800 species of fig wasps which live in association with uh, with figs and the figs depend on the wasps for pollination and the wasps depend on the figs as providing them with a place to rear their young. Um, the orchids uh, wasps are the males are, are um, lured into the flower which the orchid flower, which smells and looks and feels like a female wasp. And he attempts to mate with her, with, with the flower. And the flower dobs a big dollop of uh, pollen on his back, um, which he then of course carries to the next flower who he's also trying to mate with. So the flower is completely manipulating these male wasps and they are the only, only pollinator for those specific species. Um, coming to the other kinds of wasps, like your picnic bothering yellow jacket, they are not specific pollinators, but they are important generalist pollinators. And that's because the adults themselves are vegetarians and they need to eat sugar. They need to keep get sugar from the plant in order to, to sustain themselves. So in that way, they're visiting the plants in your garden, they're visiting wildflowers, they're visiting um, crop flowers and uh, transferring pollen between the flowers.
so given the importance of all these um, of the wasps and how diverse uh, they are and how incredible uh, products of evolution they are, we should be asking more about what a world without wasps would look like. And unfortunately, we simply don't have the answer because wasps are so understudied relative to other insects like bees, for example. We can put an economic value on the importance of bee pollination, but we can't do that for the services provided to us by wasps. So we need some more research into wasps. And one of the things that Adam and I have been doing is to try and raise the profile of wasps amongst uh, the general public, but also simultaneously also collecting really useful data on the diversity and distributions of wasps in the UK. So this is the Big Wasp Survey. It's been running for five years now. We ask members of the public to put out, to make their own beer traps, put them out in the garden. They collect the wasps, um, send them to us, or they now do online um, uh, their own home identification. And then they submit their data. And we're amassing this massive, uh, enormous amount of data from with over 2000 participants across the, uh, the whole of the UK. And the data look utterly amazing. Just This is just the data from the first year where the type of data, the we were able to build distribution maps of these uh, wasps across the UK, which were equivalent in quality to those of a 40 year long, uh, 40 years of long term data gathering. So what can we do to learn more about wasps? Um, so together with Adam, but also other people, I've been working tirelessly to try and challenge the perceptions of wasps because I think they are very unfairly maligned. Um, as well as the big wasp survey, we've made some computer games. So you can get, it's a very addictive, a bit of a warning here. You can play a computer game. You can imagine that you're, you are a wasp colony and you're trying to rear your brood. Um, if there are uh, sort of young people uh, on the call, there's an article that I've written uh, for Frontiers, which is geared at 11 to 13 year olds, which might tell you a bit more about wasps. But also, as Adam said, I've just written a book, so you can find that out as well. Thank you. Thank you, Siri. That was great. Um, it, I, I guess you'll have to go and pick up your check now from the wasp, uh, from the wasps for your press agency work and, and, pub and publicity for them. Um, if ever there was a group of insects we need to rethink, it's undoubtedly the wasps. But they're very, they're, they can be a tricky, a tricky group to sell sometimes, particularly late in the summer when people are swatting around. But as I always say to people, that's 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 the, our problem, right? We're the ones out in the garden. It's our behaviour as much as theirs. So, yeah, thanks, Sue. And I'm sure we'll get lots of questions coming through about um, about all issues to do with the wasps. So, leading on from Syrian's kind of analysis, really, of how people feel about certain types of of insects and how that might relate into how we deal with them and how we might be able to tell the story. Um, our next speaker is going to be talking about how some of those things might be put into practice. Um, Verity Jones is an assistant professor at the University of the West of England, Bristol. Her research interests lie in education and issues of social and environmental justice, within which food systems are a major part. Verity has undertaken research with seven to 11 year olds regarding the acceptance of edible insects into school meals at a time of climate and ecological emergency. And eating insects is a, is a topic that, that seems to um, really have some leverage and momentum at the moment. It seems to come up quite frequently whenever we're talking about things to do with, with insects and so on. And Verity's gonna talk about some of that research today. So Verity, over to you. That's great, thanks Adam. Um, hopefully we'll be able to see my screen, which would be great. Oops, there we go. Yes, so, I've recently been doing some work. It's fantastic to be here uh, during Insect Week to share some of that work and listen to all of the amazing um, perceptions of insects that have been going on. So I'm taking a slightly different view. I'm looking at edible insects and entomophagy, and particularly I'm interested uh, in the work that I'm now doing with Chris Bear over at Cardiff. We're particularly looking at children's perceptions. Um, so do people think that they're vile beyond belief or everyone should eat them? And there is this real kind of, um, you know, the two different extremes of how people feel about them, just as we were seeing. And uh, quite often insects are seen as the harvest wreckers, the disease spreaders within agriculture. And we really need to be thinking about, well, what does that mean at a time of climate crisis? We're in a climate crisis, we've got um, 
the, this need for more cropland by 2050, the prediction is that we'll need 42% more cropland, we'll need 120% more water, we'll need 70% more food in order to feed our growing population. Now, these are huge numbers. And yes, we can look at plant-based proteins. Yes, we can uh, reduce our, our, our meat consumption, but we could also look at different proteins such as um, lab lab meat and edible insects we've got 11 million people every day across the world eating edible insects as part of their diet um, it's something that isn't very popular in the west yet but it's something that the world health organization has said uh, in order to see what can be done in the west we need more research and that research does tend to be uh, with adults or certainly people over the age of about 20. We've got these barriers to how we might think about eating edible insects. If I was going around the room now, if we were face to face and offering you, would you be, oh, yuck, or would you be, oh, that's quite yum. So we tend to celebrate edible insects in the grotesque with things like I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, or perhaps even some of the films that Liam were talking about. It makes us kind of almost repulsive. So we were looking at how can we shift that, those kind of, outliers who perhaps think this might be young and bring it centre stage in order to start really thinking about could edible insects be a way of us feeding healthily a growing population in the future. So um, I worked with uh, on a project with Bug Farm Foods in Pembrokeshire uh, and Bug Farm Foods were developing or set the challenge to develop a tasty, healthy, sustainable edible insect based food that was accepted by children. And can I say at this point that due to Brexit, um, edible insects that are produced in the UK at the moment are not authorised. So you are not able to uh, purchase at the moment any of the, the products, but at the time they were available. Um, so this was our challenge. And when thinking about changing perceptions, the children wanted to know three main things. They wanted to know where does the food come from and how is it formed? That was really important to them because, um, as the previous speaker was saying, you know, there's that idea of uh, not only wasps, but flies and other insects being dirty or making them ill or, you know, what's going on there? There was also a real interest in how are these insects slaughtered and, 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 and then processed? Will eating insects make me ill? really important they didn't want to kind of you know get ill if, if that was a possibility and finally what does it look like now to answer these uh, and and try and provide information in order to support um that that, that the change in behavior that might come as a result um we found that um showing children what an insect farm might look like or does look like and, and, and showing all of those kind of things was really helpful as well as um, saying well actually there's 30 parts of insects in every 100 grams of chocolate um, but they're so small we can't actually take them out so we're eating insects every day there's in, uh, tiny parts of insects in bread and in pasta um, and all of these foods that we have but they 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 they're so small that it's not hurting us. It's certainly not making us ill. So, you know, providing information like this was helpful. And what does it look like? We found the children, as with the adults, don't really want, in, in the West, don't tend to want to eat a bug burger uh, where you can see uh, antennae and wings and, and, you know, parts of an insect body that might get stuck between your teeth. They wanted it to be processed. So here's Vexo, which is a vegetable and exo, exoskeleton. So you've got those two, two words together. So it's a vegetable and edible insect protein that looks very similar to a bolognese, smells just like bolognese, tastes just like a bolognese. And pupils at the end of this work, they said that they wanted sustainable options. That was really important to them, that they had the choice to be able to say, okay, I've now got the knowledge of where the beef burger and the chicken burger and the veggie burger and the edible insect burger comes from. I want to be able to make that choice. That's important to me to give me agency to do that. Young people, as I said, didn't want to see uh, in insect parts 
and they also thought it was really important that tasting um, anything like this was was, uh, was possible. So tasting um, the product um, rather than just talking about it really made a difference and, and was able to change those perceptions. So overall, the children of Wales, which is where we undertook this study with 200 children, were really positive. They wanted to see these kind of choices on the table. Um, and Chris and I are going back into schools over the next few months and extending that work into thinking about the ethics involved with those uh, and how children can critically think about future foods, which include edible insects, as well as other potential proteins that they might become available. That's fascinating. Thanks, Verity. It's really, really interesting as well. I, I had this conversation with some children in a school a while ago, and, and they all very much had the same sort of thought. They were completely up for it, but the notion of sort of the crunchy parts and so on, you know, fair enough. Um, you know, that, was, that wasn't that they want, but if we can come up with a way of processing them, um, to make them to make them acceptable I think absolutely yeah, we'll be up you, you can dry them and grind them up and it's like a flower that you can just add to things yeah. I am um, I did an event at Cheltenham Science Festival some time ago now about 10 years ago in fact it was an RES um, funded event with um, Peter Smithers and we had a, a local chef that came in and he prepared beer battered we well, basically got crickets and wrapped them in sage leaves and then beer battered them and it was funny really he did an awful lot and everyone came to try one and they were all very hesitant. But when they came around for the seconds, it was because they were actually very nice. Um, although I'm not sure that doesn't just demonstrate the fact that anything battered and fried is, is quite nice. But he also did stir fries with chopped up mealworms and things that added a real kind of nuttiness to it. it was yeah, pe People were up for it when they were cooked properly. Um, so that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, that concludes all of our, all of our panelists kind of uh, tank on phobias and phillies. Um, Lots and lots of things in the chat here, which would be quite nice to um, quite nice to to go to. One of the the features that have, one of the sort of um, things that's dropped out or kind of developed there is the idea that our early exposure to insects and our parental um, attitudes, uh, what we've experienced at school, might well have a role to play. And I thought I'd throw that to all of the panelists, kind of um, perhaps starting in reverse order, actually, given that Verity, you've just been talking about going into schools and working with schools. What sort of effect do you think that, that our parental exposure and, and experience has? And I'm saying that as a parent as well, so I'm always up for, up for tips to make my children less. No, uh, less it, has, it absolutely it has a huge effect. So um, as well as my research, I um, I'm an ex-teacher, primary teacher, and I do teacher training within University of West of England, Bristol. So I'm, I'm in, in school lots and lots, and research has been done to show that a teacher's actions and how a teacher reacts to a spider in the room or reacts to flies coming in or uh, Syrian wasps perish the thought um, has a huge impact on how the children in that classroom uh, are affected so certainly here we in, in as part of their training we, we talk about this and how important it is for our, our teachers and our student teachers to model positive behavior around insects even if inside they're crying and dying they can't show that, <laughs> that fear um, or try not to show that fear and work through that fear so that it's not handed on to the children within their class so that we are really uh, working towards positive insect behavior and, and, and a love for them, a real respect for them. Yeah, thank you. And I guess the same, the same question onto, onto everyone else, but let's start with Syrian as well, particularly um, given your work with wasps and the fact you work with primary schools and the fact that you have children, um, all, all seem to make you quite well qualified to, to answer this question as well. So what's, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think I absolutely agree with what Verity said, but I, I, I'm really really keen to to hear that that you've actually gone and gathered data on how teachers can influence children um i think the way that we behave with wasps is definitely a culturally ingrained learned response um but having said that you know there is also um a, a long-standing cultural history of us disliking wasps so you know, even back as far as Aristotle and the Bible and all these very ancient texts, they talk about wasps in a very negative way. Um, and so we are, we, we sort of grow up with this 
uh, perception that they are evil things. In fact, I do remember my my daughter a few years ago when she was in primary school coming home from school with um, some writing uh, uh, a task they had to do in school and it was one of those fill in the gap things and it was something like I hate wasps because and they had to fill in what what it was I was like well you know if there isn't if they're not horribly leading question yeah exactly they're conditioning children to to dislike wasps um and so I think if we can I think we can take a two-pronged approach here and I this is what I always say to people at picnics is that if you don't want your kids to get stung then don't flap don't behave like their their main um, predator, which is a badger. You know, don't throw your limbs around and breathe all over them because they're responding to the carbon dioxide. They're responding to the fact you're flying your arms around. They're actually not interested in stinging you at all unless you start behaving like a badger, and then they'll start to try and try and. Uh, um, uh, sting you and they also have such good vision that they're kind of you know they hover in front of you like this and they're, it's because they're actually checking you out not to sting you but to see if you might have some kind of food source that could be interesting and I think people find that quite intimidating um, so I think you know the parents role um, in influencing kids at the picnic table has an important um, part to play um, but also what really gets me is that we don't give kids any positive messaging about wasps from a young age. Um, that, for example, through literature, you know, how many books on bees does the average parent have on their child's bookcase? And you can, you know, the amount of the number of books you can buy pop up bees, and it's all about. We tell kids a lot about bees. We tell them how important they are. We tell them how cute, cute they are. We teach them to empathise with the bee. We don't do anything like that for wasps. No, you're absolutely right. And I think the advice of don't behave like a badger is probably good for, for most aspects of, of life as well. Um, Fran, you're, 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 yes, I was, I was going to throw over to, to, to you two now as well, Fran and Liam. And, and you know, you, you can bring in that sort of cultural perspective. Fran, you're holding you're holding a book up there. So let's um, let, let's let's go to you first and, and get some some of your thoughts on how important perhaps not just not just our parental and home um, atmosphere might be, but also the cultural world in which we grew up in. Yeah, and this is really interesting because I was just saying to Sarian earlier, um, it's um, one of the one of the works that I find really interesting is Alice in Wonderland. Um, Lewis Carroll was a massive uh, entomology enthusiast. Um, he collected all sorts of books on uh, insects, and he was one of those people who read those Victorian natural history books that were very very positive about you know if you hate a creature in creation, and you know this is created by God, so you know you shouldn't really hate it because it's God's creation that's good, right? Um, then we need to reconsider what they actually do, and it's really interesting because you read all of these books and he studied. Um, wasps in particular very closely and of course all of the creatures in his books are also puns but um, this chapter um, the wasp in the wig is actually a chapter dropped from Through the Looking Glass, the second part of the Alice in Wonderland books, in which Alice meets a wasp that is ailing and dying. And it's it's really concluding the narrative arc of Through the Looking Glass, in which she first encounters the looking glass insects, the wasp, uh, the anat, and she says, I hate insects. I don't like them at all because they sting. And then it, the wasp, well, the, the gnat first introduces her to all of these insects and she studies them in nature and does exactly what Lewis Carroll himself did. And and learns that they're actually really fascinating they're threatened by all sorts of things and their biodiversity is very fragile and this is the 19th century and the final chapter of this is the wasp in the wig in which Alice encounters this ailing wasp and remembers it has a function in nature and she helps the wasp cross um, the river to get to the tree where it wants to rest and in the end says well actually it's a very nice thing to understand these creatures and to not no longer be scared of them and actually be nice to them but that's of course the chapter that got dropped from through the looking glass and so that's really really interesting so you know there there are there are those there's those like this literature out there but um you know of course um there also isn't so i thought that's a really interesting example of what you were saying yeah thanks Brandon. we'll return to that that point actually because it links into a couple of questions about how we might shift people's opinions um liam certainly my my sketchy knowledge of um of insect films is that they're nearly all negative <laughs> like i'm struggling to think of any positive depictions of of insects in films how important do you think those sorts of cultural representations when people watch films are in in shaping exactly how people think rather than just reflecting it 
Well, it's interesting because when when I was growing up, I had a uh, sort of innate fascination with like killer bug films like Arachnophobia and stuff like that. And I'd watch them purely because they had spiders in them and stuff like that. I loved seeing these exotic, uh, you know, insects and bugs and arachnids from everywhere else in the world. So I, I watched them because I loved seeing these on screen. And I also liked the, the horror films. But at the same time, I, I, it, was, it, was, it was upsetting that you'd, they'd always die in the end. It was, I didn't like seeing that. Um, and then in the, later on in the 90s, you did get a few films like, um, like A Bug's Life and Ants and stuff like that that were sort of, that created more like child-friendly sort of characters out of these sort of in, insects and stuff like that. So uh, that, to me at least, definitely sort of, like re, definitely sort of reinforces like the positive um, connotations that, that, you know, bugs should be given. And, and while there is a, a place for killer bug films and horror films and all those sort of stuff, it's almost like we've kind of lost the way in, in terms of like uh, depicting them on screen in a sort of sense, I guess. We don't really, I can't remember the last time there was a film, um, I could be wrong, but like in the last few years, like a sort of like a big sort of like animated film or something like that, where they've been uh, depicted more positively uh, or like a character that can, that carry, that children can latch onto in some sort of sense. So I think that um, in terms, culturally, I think that could be um, a big factor. Yeah, no. Yeah. And from, someone's mentioned the B movie on the on the chat thread, and certainly yeah, yeah, social sure, insect yeah. biologist. Um, it's always slight, and I'm sure Syrian will share my distress at watching um, those films with all the male uh, ants and bees doing all doing all mm -hmm. these work and going out and being heroic and stuff. And it's like, no, they're just flying sperm. But it's difficult to get that across in a children's film, perhaps in a, in a, in a way that's acceptable. Um, what, one of the questions that's come in. Uh, from Nicholas here and, and also a couple further up the chat is, is thinking about how we might change people's minds. And, and this is something that I've been quite interested in in thinking about over the last year or two as well. Uh, it's all very well for us that like like insects and certainly judging from the, the poll earlier, everybody in the um, everybody in the, the event that likes insects. But but really, we should be going to the people that hate insects and finding out how we can change their minds. Um, Fran, you've mentioned about ecology a couple of times and about pulling in some of those bigger pictures um, so I'll pr perhaps go to you first. What, what sort of ways do you think we can, how can we turn people to the light, if you like, when it comes to insects? What sort of stories and narratives would be affected? Well, it's really interesting because I so I'm, keep clinging on to moths like Sarian cl keeps clinging on to math, uh, uh, wasps, wasps. But the interesting thing for me is that, it, you know, for, for me, this happens with moths every time I teach a seminar. Um, it's we we are surrounded by really negative stereotypes about moths. Um, and when we actually learn a little bit more about them, about what they do and um, the fascinating ways in which they have put, been portrayed in other cultures and at other times as a really rather positive things. This can really, really sway, um, uh, sway our intentions. So basically by the end of my seminars, almost all of my students actually, because I, I poll them as well. Um, and they, they say, actually, the one thing I take away from these classes is moths, because all of these things that are positive about bees, like pollination, um, the things that are positive about butterflies, they're really beautiful. And, you know, they do all of these fascinating things and they also pollinate colony moths also do so picking one of these things and unraveling the preconception saying where did they come from um does that actually stand the test of facts and you know if you like this one why not this one um it actually it's really easy to dismantle that because I think in one point these Victorian and uh, naturalists did have a point take looking to at these creatures sort of face almost face to face seeing them magnified and sort of decentering the anthropocentric view saying well i don't matter here like if i if we just pay attention to what role they play in nature actually can i maybe understand them better and understanding them better actually almost always changes people's minds entirely yeah and no, i agree and i think um, i think it's one of the things we need more data on as well we need to be able to 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 probe in a sort of qual uh, quantitative way exactly what's going on. Um, Liam, you're also interested in story and narrative and so on. Do you, do you agree with what Fran said and what, what else would you add to that? Um, yeah, I think it's just important to sort of like enforce that we um, like stress the importance of their function in, in the ecosystems, which I think a lot of the killer bug films do. Um, but the sort of 
you know, the histrionics and like the horror that surrounds it that goes on top of these films almost takes precedence in a sort of sense. Uh, like my, the purpose of my study was to sort of look at these films and the pattern that I, I came, that I got through with these films that was sort of uh, current all the way through was that humans do something wrong, the bugs retaliate and sort of like to try and redress this equilibrium. So I think just sort of like if, if the killer bug films are going to sort of like carry on in that sort of sense, then um, th that sort of, they need to be a bit more nuanced in sort of like explaining why, you know, why this sort of like uh, insurrection in nature has come about. And as they went on, like, especially towards like the 90s, when you got films like Arachnophobia and Mimic, then these films were a lot more nuanced in, in like how they were dealing with these issues. So I think that that needs to sort of like, if there's going to be like another, you know, like killer book film, like another big one, um, then it's, it's going to have to be one that sort of deals it with those sort of ideas. Uh, a lot more nuance. Yeah, a lot, a lot more, a lot more nuance sums up um, sums up an awful lot of things at the moment, isn't it? In terms of what we need, um, Syrian, you you mentioned the ecological importance of of wasps. One of the questions that's come up in chat is whether or not delving into the social life of of the insects like wasps, ants, and bees would provide the sorts of stories that you think people would would sort of uh, will resonate with people and maybe change their mind. Do you think that's something that that we should play on more? So I don't think it really works. Um, so I've been talking about the amazing social <laughs> lives of wasps. I shut uh, that down. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. I, I, I thought, I mean, I'm fascinated by the social behaviour of wasps and bees and ants. And I've spent the last, you know, 15 years talking, well, the first 15 years of my wasp life, talking about, you know, to the public about how amazing these social lives of wasps are. And people go, oh, yeah, it's quite cool. Um, but actually, as soon as I started talking about ecosystem services and what wasps do for you suddenly everyone is interested and in fact now and I, I just put in the chat actually that I try and do these polls when I give um, giving online talks is great because you can do so many more of these things but I do a sort of a Mentimeter online poll and I get people to put up the words that they think about wasps at the beginning of the talk and then at the end of the talk so I can see have they changed their kind of the words they use to describe wasps but in some of the school groups I've done recently, I've also asked them to rate the things that I've talked about in my talk as to how important they were in changing their appreciation for wasps. And I have things like their enormous diversity, their like, you know, their assassins um, and their social behavior and, and of course their ecosystem services. And invariably ecosystem services always is the thing that changes their perceptions of wasps. That's really interesting um, and not, yeah, a little bit surprising in a sense. You would think that, that people would, I, I suppose as an entomologist, we, get, we like all the cute stories, but actually that's, that's why we like insects. It's not us that we should be asking. It's the, it's the people that don't like them. Um, Verity, we're, we're rapidly getting towards the end of our, um, of our event. So I just want to ask you the same question. What sort of stories and narratives do you think are most effective in terms of turning people around? Um, well, I'm not sure whether I've frozen or not, but I am. You so have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're visually frozen or you're an amazing mime. But you are <laughs> yeah. so, so I am still here. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> That's all right. The, for me, I think for behaviour change, um, it's having access. It's having access to the actual, um, the, the outdoors in order to recognise and, and be part of the ecosystem. Um, the, the anthropocentric gaze so so recognizing their uh, insects as part of the system is hugely important um but in order to get a personal positive um relationship i think actually having the the, the skills to critically think about those um those issues and also have a, a physical relationship with insects and the outdoors i think that that's crucial that's brilliant. Thank you, Verity. And thank you to all the panellists and thank you to everyone taking part today. Um, this is a topic we could be talking about all afternoon and I think only just scratched the surface of it. Uh, there are so many different aspects to insects and their, their lives and their interactions with us. If you want to find out more about insects and you want to take part in Insect Week, then please do visit insectweek.co.uk. Uh, where you can find out all about what's going on in the area around you, the live events that are going on, uh, the in-person events as well as the online events. And there's also some photography uh, or a photography competition, um, which is always worthwhile taking part in and an art competition too, and various other things that you can find on the, um, on the website there. We weren't able, unfortunately, to get to everyone's questions and, and comments, but 
perhaps that just means we need to run something similar next year and, and delve deeper into what sort of stories we can use to change people's minds. But for now, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to everyone at the RES for supporting the event and for making it happen. And thank you for turning up and enjoy the rest of Insect Week. Thanks very much. <laughs>